Acquired savant syndrome usually, and unfortunately, starts with something awful. A concussion from a car crash, a sudden stroke, or the opposite. The slow creeping fog of a neurological disease. Whether there's a specified moment of impact or a gradual change, in the aftermath, something is different. Not wrong, necessarily, but new. This is acquired savant syndrome, and it's one of the strangest things that can happen to the human mind. It's not about people who were already brilliant before the trauma. It's about ordinary people, accountants, salespeople, factory workers, who have some type of brain injury. And when the dust settles, they suddenly have an incredible genius-level skill they never had before. Once in a while, a story like this makes headline news. A man gets hit in the head, and suddenly he's a piano virtuoso, playing complex music he's never even heard before. A woman suffers a stroke and wakes up with the ability to paint with breathtaking skill, even though she could barely draw a stick figure her whole life. A person with dementia who, as their language and social skills begin to fade, suddenly develops an obsessive, brilliant new talent for painting or sculpting. The big question, of course, is how does this happen? How does damage to the brain somehow make it better at something? Nobody knows for sure, but there are a couple of fascinating hypotheses. One idea is that we all have these raw abilities inside us, but our brains are too busy working, managing, filtering, and processing the world around us. An injury might just switch off that manager aspect of the brain. We see this happen with people who have frontotemporal dementia. The disease can severely damage the part of the brain that controls our inner critic. As the illness progresses, a stunning, often obsessive artistic ability can emerge, like a creative floodgate has been opened. Another thought is that when the brain is damaged, it desperately tries to rewire itself to fix the broken parts. In that scramble to reconnect things, it might accidentally connect the dots in a brilliant new way, creating a shortcut to genius that wasn't there before. But what's it like for the person and their family? When it comes from an accident, it's a shocking new reality to adapt to. But when it emerges from a disease, it can be a strange and heartbreaking trade-off, a brilliant new gift appearing just as the person you once knew is starting to fade. They gain a new way to express themselves, even as they lose others. It's a powerful, unsettling thought that inside the ordinary mind we walk around with every day, there might be an accidental genius just waiting for the right wires to cross. Picture the face of someone you love. See their eyes, the curve of their smile, the features you know as well as your own name. It's an image that feels whole, instant, and deeply familiar. Now imagine looking at that same person and seeing only a collection of parts. Two eyes, a nose, a mouth, all clear as day. But the recognition, the part that tells you that you know who they are, is gone. The face holds no more meaning than that of a stranger you pass on the street. This is the daily reality for someone with prosopagnosia, a baffling neurological condition more commonly known as face blindness. It's not a problem with vision. A person with prosopagnosia can describe a face in detail, the color of the eyes, the shape of the jaw, the presence of a scar. But their brain can't assemble those pieces into a coherent, recognizable identity. Every face, from their closest family member to a famous celebrity, is new every time they see it. To navigate the world, they have to become detectives of identity. They learn to recognize people by a constellation of other clues, a unique hairstyle, a particular pair of glasses, the sound of their voice, the rhythm of their walk, or the clothes they usually wear. A meeting with a friend can turn into a moment of anxiety if that friend gets a new haircut or even changes their coat. Every social gathering is a minefield of potentially offending someone by not recognizing them. This condition can be something a person is born with, going through life thinking they're just bad with faces. Or it can happen suddenly after a stroke or a brain injury damages a tiny specialized neighborhood in the brain responsible for facial processing. Perhaps the most unsettling part of prosopagnosia is what happens when a person looks in the mirror. Many report a sense of disconnect, of seeing a stranger looking back at them, even if just for a moment, before logic and context kick in to remind them who they are. It's a profound glitch in the brain's architecture of identity. Prosopagnosia is a stark and intimate reminder that one of our most fundamental human connections, the simple act of looking at another person and knowing them, hangs by a fragile neurological thread. It reveals the incredible work our brains do every second, assembling a world of familiar faces we so easily take for granted. If each person is the star of their own television show, visual snow syndrome ensures that some viewers can never quite get a perfect signal. Over every image, every sky, 
every room, every face, there is a persistent layer of static. Tiny flickering colorless dots swarm your entire field of vision, like a fine layer of sand being constantly thrown in front of your eyes. When you look at a clear blue sky, you see a buzzing texture. When you close your eyes in a dark room, the static is still there, chaos where there should be peaceful blackness. Welcome to the world of visual snow syndrome. For those who have it, this constant visual static is the inescapable backdrop to their lives. But the snow is often just the beginning. The condition usually brings a host of other strange disturbances with it. Many experience palinopsia, where images linger like a visual echo, long after they're gone. Bright lights can be painfully overwhelming, a condition called photophobia. And for many, the noise isn't just visual. They also live with a constant, high-pitched ringing in their ears known as tinnitus, meaning that even silence is never truly silent. The strange truth of visual snow syndrome is that the eyes of the people who have it are often perfectly healthy. The problem isn't in the lens or the retina. This is a neurological condition, a disorder of how the brain processes the signals it receives from the eyes. It's like the brain's visual volume knob is stuck on 11, amplifying all the background noise that should normally be filtered out. For decades, this was a deeply isolating and misunderstood condition. Sufferers would go to doctors and describe their static-filled vision, only to be told their eyes were fine. They were often dismissed, told it was just anxiety, that they were imagining things, or that they were simply noticing the normal floaters everyone sees. They were living with a constant, undeniable reality that the medical world refused to see. Only recently has visual snow syndrome been recognized as a distinct and legitimate neurological disorder, giving validation to the thousands of people who knew something was wrong but had no name for it. It's a reminder that what we call sight isn't just what our eyes see, but what our brain chooses to show us. And sometimes, that signal gets corrupted. Think back to a specific date, say, September 14th, five years ago. Do you remember what you were doing, what the weather was like, what the big news of the day was? For most of us, the past is a soft focus blur, with only the most significant moments standing out. The rest kind of just fades away. Now imagine someone who can answer that question instantly, and not just for five years ago, but for almost any day of their adult life. This isn't a parlor trick or a learned skill. It's a rare and mysterious condition known as highly superior autobiographical memory, or HSAM. For the few dozen people in the world identified with it, the past isn't a collection of fading snapshots. It's a perfectly preserved, high-definition video library, and every day is a meticulously cataloged file. Ask them about a random date from their past, and they can tell you the day of the week, what they wore, who they spoke to, and how they felt, all with effortless, startling clarity. Their memory is involuntary and automatic. They don't study their past, they just relive it. But what sounds like a superpower comes with a profound and heavy burden. We rely on our memories to fade, to soften at the edges, allowing us to heal and move on. For a person with HSAM, that never happens. Every argument, every mistake, Every moment of grief or embarrassment doesn't recede into the fog of time. It remains permanently on deck, playing back with the clarity and emotional punch of it happening all over again. The emotional scar tissue never fully forms. Scientists are still trying to understand how this is possible. Brain scans show that people with HSAM have structural differences in the parts of the brain related to memory, with supercharged connections between the areas that store facts and those that store feelings. It's not just that they have a better memory. Their entire relationship with their own past is fundamentally different. They are living timelines, walking archives of their personal history. Their extraordinary ability makes us ask a fundamental question about ourselves. Is our imperfect fading memory a flaw, or is it one of the most human things about us? A merciful way our mind works that allows us to let go and live in the present. The room is quiet and filled with the kind of resigned stillness that surrounds the end of a long life. A loved one, perhaps someone whose mind has been clouded for years by the fog of dementia, lies in their bed. They haven't recognized family in a decade. They haven't spoken a coherent sentence in ages. They are, for all intents and purposes, a ghost in their own body, and the family has already grieved the loss of the person they once knew. But then the seemingly unthinkable happens. Their eyes open and for the first time in years, they are clear. The fog is gone. They turn to their son or daughter, and with their old voice, say their name. They might ask for their favorite meal, share a vivid memory from childhood, 
tell a joke, or simply say, I love you. For a few minutes or even a few hours, the person they were is completely and inexplicably back. This stunning, mysterious return is known as terminal lucidity. It's most often reported in patients with severe neurodegenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's, but also in those with brain tumors, strokes, or even just organ failure. It's a paradox that stumps scientists. How can a mind reemerge, fully intact, from a brain that is physically shutting down or has been all but destroyed by disease? It's like a shattered engine suddenly roaring back to life for one final lap. There are no solid scientific explanations, only theories that feel inadequate in the face of such a profound event. But for the families and caregivers who witness it, the why doesn't matter. They aren't seeing a medical anomaly. They are being given a gift. It is a special moment, a chance for closure, to have one last meaningful conversation, to hear that voice one more time. It's an opportunity to say goodbye not to the disease, but to the person. Almost without exception, the person passes away peacefully within hours or days of this final rally. Terminal lucidity doesn't solve the mystery of the mind. It doesn't explain where we go or what's left of us when we die. It just leaves behind a moment that feels too strange, too beautiful, and too haunting to forget. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Fireside Unsolved. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe to help the channel grow. Until next time, take it easy and be easy, you filthy bastards.